good morning once again, everybody. I'm going to give a big shout out to those about 30 or 40 people camping. I told you to give you a shout out Cornerstone Church camping trip today. Uh, they're getting one big hurrah before next week is uh, Memorial Day, and then we're heading into the fall. Are you guys ready for Christmas? Okay. <laughs> You know, I, I, I like that commercial on television. It's the most wonderful time of the year when the kids go back to school. So right, they're going back to school. So our lives get back to normal. Have you noticed, though, maybe I'm the only one, that summer can kind of be an interesting time. It's a lot of fun, but you get off schedule. And so the things you normally do, you don't do. And sometimes you get out of schedule spending time with God. It's not that you don't want to. It's just that your schedule happens to me, too. I find myself... Uh, you know, I don't have to be in place at certain times, and you don't get up the same time, and things happen, you go on vacation, and then all of a sudden, you can't, you're not praying as much, not reading the Word as much, and you start, you find yourself just a little out of sorts. Uh, maybe you go to the lake house, or you go to the beach, and you're busy every weekend, you get out of the habit. And so, uh, what we like to be able to do is kind of reposition ourselves from the fall. Because the fall is a very interesting time. In the natural, if you're aware of the fact that farming, they plant seeds, and then the harvest is in the fall. That's when you take the harvest. And it's very interesting to me, not just to me, to many others, we've noticed that the fall is also a time for the harvest for the church, that we see more and more people come to know Jesus Christ. We're able to make more of an impact this time of the year, perhaps in any other time of the year. And so what we like to be able to do is get ourselves situated and calibrated for the new season we're heading. That's why we're having something called the 21 Days of Prayer, starting today. And so what we're doing is we're taking these next 21 days to refocus, to recalibrate our lives, to make sure that God is first in all that we do. It's starting today to September 15th. We'll have prayer services every day at the church, Monday through Friday, <coughs> excuse me, at 6 a.m. Right here, I'll be here. We'll have various folks sharing. And you can also stream it live on, online as well. And we'll rebroadcast it throughout the day so you can catch up. I want to encourage you to take this time to go ahead and do that as we get closer to God. Let's get right into our message today, which is closer. And this is all about how do we get closer to God. Let's get right into it. First of all, I want to mention something very, very important. Atheists, agnostics, religious people, everyone, every human being is a worshiper. Every, no one's exempt. Every human being is a worshiper. What is worship? What does worship look like? Everyone does it, whether you recognize it or not. The question is, what do you worship? I'm going to show you a little clip in a few seconds about how worship can be at church and outside of church and what some worship looks like. Let's go ahead. All right, okay, well, <laughs> you know, I hope no one's going like this this morning here, this morning, but it, it's very interesting. We often think church services, isn't it interesting you go to a church service, and it can be sometimes the most boring time of the week because 
You're not supposed to do anything in church. But the truth of the matter is you and I are designed and made for worship. And whether who doesn't make a difference who you are, everyone worships. And so they'll, they'll have explosions, they'll have lights, they'll have uh, bands playing, people throwing balloons in the air, confetti. People are worshiping what? Right? But you come to church, you're weird if you, if you show. He's kind of emotional. But in a sports arena or wherever you were at, I've seen some of you guys, you know, with your kids playing soccer, getting in fights. Not, not here in this church, of course. But people worship all the time. And, and so God has created us to worship. And if we don't worship God, we're going to worship something else. Well, what is worship all about anything? We all worship something, even atheists worship. They worship at the altar of self. Right? It's just, it's just part of it. Worship, by the way, is love expressed. You are expressing love to something, something you like. It can be anything. It can be sports. It can be your kids, what have you. Not only that, but worship is a response to what we value the most. You want to know what you value the most? How do you spend your time? How do you spend your money? What do you think of first? What's the thing that you do that time disappears? It's like, wow, two hours went by. And I know that's church. I know. But what is <laughs> worship is a response to what we value the most. Now, what's the meaning of worship? The Greek word and the Hebrew word, in many ways, means this. It means to prostrate, your, not prostate, prostrate yourself towards the Lord. It's like you're bowing down like this, and what you're doing is you're, you're getting down, and you're laying down. What you're doing is you are putting something else above you. You are lowering yourself to something else. Everyone worships. You can worship good things. In fact, church can become worship in itself. Religion can become worship in itself. And you can start worshiping good things. You can worship the Bible. You can worship worship. You can worship all sorts of wonderful things. You can worship small groups and all that. And what the problem is, if you start worshiping the things of God instead of God, you're out of balance, you're out of sorts. Well, what's the deal with that? Well, this meaning of worship is to prostrate yourself towards something. And see, what has happened is you can see very clearly in the book of Romans, a great exchange takes place. I encourage you to go and read Romans 1 and Romans 2. Romans 1 deals primarily with those outside of the faith. Romans 2 deals with people in, inside the faith. Romans 1, Paul's throwing red meat to the church. They're eating it up. Romans chapter 2 goes, and you guys are worse. So anyhow, he goes on. This is what he says. Although they knew God. You see, everyone knows God. Even an atheist knows God. Oh, no, they don't. Yes, they do. Everyone senses there has to be something else rather than I see. Come on, everybody. You'd have to really think about it. A cement truck, a steel truck, a nail truck, and a drywall truck collide on Route 70, and miraculously, this building is built. And that's not going to happen, right? Everyone knows deep down that there's a God, and the Bible even says it. You have a knowledge of God, but if you reject that knowledge and you push it away, all of a sudden you get calloused on your God part. Everyone has a God section inside. You are wired for God. They've done brain scans, and when you pray, a certain part of your brain lights up. It doesn't light up any other time. Science is kind of even starting to show us a little bit about this. But although they knew God, because it's obvious, the Bible says you can look Look at the beauty. Look at the, if, you're, if you're a father or you're a parent and you see a newborn baby, it's a miracle, right? So they know there's something out there. They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they were futile in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened. When you don't recognize your creator and you don't connect to the source of who you are, it's almost like a cell. If you think about a cell, you have a nucleus in the middle. That's the command center of that cell. If, that's, if that nucleus is messed up and there's a problem in that nucleus, it begins to reproduce a cell that's unhealthy. It can be cancerous where it multiplies and it kills the organism. My friends, if we don't have God in the center of our lives, you know what happens? We start re re reproducing sick cells. A disease begins to go through our body. Before you know it, it's fatal. Because you and I are designed 
to be with God. Everyone is. So their thinking and their foolish hearts were dark. And what happens then? Claiming to be wise, right? Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged. You exchange the glory of the immortal God for the images resembling mortal man. Now, we may not worship reptiles and snakes and all that, but do we worship sports? Do we worship pop stars? Do we worship political parties? Do we worship ideologies? Do we worship a 401k? Do we worship retirement? Do we worship the crowd we get to hang out with in school, the clothes we can wear, the people we can meet? Do we worship getting married? Do we worship being single? Do we worship having kids? Do we worship church? We all worship something and we make an exchange. When you make an exchange, that nucleus of who you are gets infected with a virus and you start reproducing cells that are unhealthy. And what we want to do is do some gene therapy and get sure our DNA has Christ in the center of it all, that we can reproduce godliness in our lives. You see, the truth of the matter is all of us have cancer cells in our body, but your body will fight that from what I understand. And so what happens is your immune system is strong. If you keep God in your life and Christ the center, you can ward off these things. But if you do not spend time and you don't put God in the center of your life, what begins to happen is your spiritual immune system gets sick. And all of a sudden you start having reproduction of all kinds of things that will take you down and destroy life. That's the devil's job. Exchanging the glory of God. The immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and, and animals and creeping things. And I like what Jack Hayford says, one of my favorite pastors in all the world. Married to his same wife for over 60 years, still serving God. His wife has passed on uh, with the Lord. I had a distinct opportunity to spend a month with him with 40 other pastors. Tremendous man of God. This is what he says. Worship changes the worshiper into the image of the one worshiped. You are what you worship. If you worship things, things will control you, and you'll become, you'll become mechanical. You become unfeeling. Whatever you worship, you will become. How do we exchange? What are some ways we exchange? One of the ways we do is substitution. I'm going to substitute God for something else. We all do it, everybody. That's why we have to fight against it. Our, you understand the infections of sin come in. We, it, we hopefully will deal with it with the Spirit of God in us, the antibodies, to deal with the stuff that comes in us. But if we don't deal with the antibodies and our antibodies get weak, then the disease of sin can take over. Does that make sense? All right? So, substitution. We can substitute for various things. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 6, 14 and 15, do not follow other gods. There are other gods out there. Whatever gets your attention, whatever is number one in your life, that's a God. Do not follow gods of the people around you. For the Lord your God is among you, is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy from the face of the earth, he will destroy you, what pray, you from the face of the land. Aren't you guys excited about that? Isn't that good news, everybody? Isn't that, isn't that, I don't know, that's encouraging to me, right? You're reading that thinking, what on earth is that all about? God's a jealous God? What is God, some egotistical maniac? He needs accolades of people? I, I have a father or mother like that. I'm married to someone like that, right? What kind of person wants to be worshipped? That's weird, man. That's strange. No, no, let me explain. That's not true. Is it, is it stupid for us? to take the sun out of our solar system. Of course. The planets revolve around the sun. It's the sun that brings life to this planet. It orbits around. My friends, you are designed by God for God. Until you give yourself to God, you hurt yourself and other people. God wants you to worship, not for his good, for your good, because he loves you. And so he's very passionate about what he loves. And yes, he'll protect what he loves. And sometimes he'll use extreme measures. But God's purpose is not to condemn the world, but save the world. Very clear throughout Scripture. But he's passionate about this, everybody. He's passionate about you. He's passionate about his creation being mishandled. How do we exchange? Substitution. We substitute something else. And it can happen here at church. I can substitute what I like. I like it this way. 
I like church a certain way. It's got to be 68 degrees. It's got to be 75 degrees. It's got to be 80 decibels. It's got to be 180 decibels. <laughs> it's got to be, it's got to have pipe organ music. It's got to have praise and worship music. I like when the pastor wears suits and ties. I like when he wears shorts. You don't want to see my legs, believe me. But we substitute. We have, and we have these things that we want to do. And the second thing is pride. Pride is, it's all about me. Me. It's all about me. It's what I want. I'm the most important thing in this church, not you. And so as we're singing that song, that song again? How many times have they sang that song? I don't like that song. I don't like that person. I'm going to put my hands in my pocket or look at, my, uh, look at Google for a bit or look at my news app until they're done. When they do the real song I like, then I'll enter back in. And we start making all the stuff up. That could be a form of pride. In fact, it happened to me. I was in India on a mission trip, and it was perhaps one of the worst pieces of music I've ever heard in my life. It was awful. The worship was horrible musically. They had a Casio keyboard. Probably bought it at a Radio Shack in America and shipped to India. They had, they had these horrible speakers that were crackling. The guy was playing like the internal drums on the keyboard. It was awful. And he wasn't even hitting, and he had a sitar sound on a Casio. It's bad. Then you had 4,000, 5,000 people singing at the top of their lungs. The person on the microphone, it sounded like you were in New York City subway. You know what I'm talking about? You don't understand what they're saying. Of course, they're not speaking the English language. How dare they not speak the English language when I'm an American? I'm just kidding, okay? But you're sitting there, and I'm thinking, God, this is lame. I'm going to wait till I go and speak to everybody because I'm going to be the speaker. I want the Lord to say, what are you, what are you doing? I'm like, what? I've heard the Lord say, you got issues, son. They're worshiping me with a joyful noise. How dare you look down on their worship as if you or I are better? And all of a sudden, I repented. And I lifted my hands in the air, and I began to worship God, and he entered into a powerful worship time. Why? It's not about me. It's about God. Okay, it's not about you. And then sometimes you, you do stuff. Sometimes I watch movies with my children. I don't want to watch these silly movies, but the kids like them. Why? I love my kids. I want to be with my kids. And so as a church, we want to be all things to all people that people come to know God, right? So substitution, we have pride. You know, concentrating more about what other people think. Of. What do people think of me? In John 12, 42, Jesus says this. Many people did believe in him, however, including some of the Jewish leaders. But they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue. I can't do that. I'm, they're not going to accept me. I have to go with the flow. Uh, I'm, how about this? You go to a restaurant. It's time to pray for the meal. I don't know. Lord Jesus, we pray for that meal. Keep, keep your eyes open. Lord Jesus. No, why not be bold, right? We went to, we went to Virginia, and we, we're in a parking lot at the outlets, and a woman comes out of her car, puts an oriental rug down, and faces towards Mecca in the middle of the parking lot. And I'm like, Wow. Why can't we be like that? No shame. I will be bold, right? But they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from their synagogue. What happens if someone comes to your house that's not a believer? Are you ashamed to pray for your meal? If you are, that, that kind of shows that you have a little bit of a problem with people. Now that you all feel guilty, you can leave. Now, okay, here we go. Why was there a problem with the Pharisees? These people believed in Jesus. But they don't want to rock the religious boat, right? The religious boat says it's this. And what happened? For they loved human praise more than the praise of God. Are you more interested in your church friends when maybe the church is doing something that is wrong? Someone is gossiping. Someone's tearing someone down in the church. Someone's speaking things that are not right. And you know it's not right. But you're in with the in crowd and you don't want to hurt them. You don't want to, you don't want to lose favor. Sometimes I can be with other pastors and they start talking about stuff they shouldn't be talking about and compromising because we're all Christians after all. You gotta stand up and do what's right. Okay? For they love human praise more than the praise of God. Again, it's prostrating yourself down. Okay? Above something else. So we have substitution, we have pride. And you know what hedonism is? This is what our culture is all about, unfortunately. Hedonism is this, the belief that pleasure or happiness is the purpose of life. In fact, that's one of the rights as an American citizen we have, right? We have the right to the what? The pursuit of what? 
happiness, right? The God of America, in God we trust, the God of, God of America is happiness. I got to be happy, right? Whatever makes you happy, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, that's all that matters. If two plus two equals seven to me, don't you tell me it's four because it makes me happy. I'm happy that two plus two equals seven. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. That's a hate crime. Really? Right? We substitute it. Pleasure and happiness is the purpose of life. I have to feel good. Do you know how many times I've heard people say, what's going on? I'm leaving him. Why? I'm not. I'm not happy. I'm not happy. And after all, it says in Bucci 3.17, above all things, be happy for it's God's will for your life in Christ Jesus. Doesn't it say that? No, it doesn't say that. How, God wants us holy, not happy. Happiness is based upon happenstance. Joy is based upon a future fact of who we are in Christ. So the belief that pleasure or happiness is the purpose of life. Do you see this happening in our culture right now? Insanity is beginning to happen. Stuff is incredible. Like, what? Now, I, I know I'm going to step on some toes. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just show what's going on. Is that pe th th now there, there's a group of people saying that when a baby's born, it's not a boy or a girl, it's a baby. Excuse me? Yes, we're going to let the child decide what it wants. I don't even know to have Captain Crunch or oatmeal before I'm 15. And now we're telling kids, you decide, you have kids run your life, you're going to be a maniac. We're supposed to help kids choose the right path. Insanity, what we're hearing today. Now, I'm not saying that in anger. It's just a, it's a sad state of affairs because we are worshiping hedonism, whatever makes me happy, except Jesus Christ. Ah, you can't. No, 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 that's wrong. You believe in Jesus. That's wrong. Why? Because he says he's the only way. There's many ways. You see that, everybody? This is what's happening, and we're doing it too. When you think, I like it this way in church. Uh, and I, I've been in people's homes, not in this church, but how's it going? Well, the pastor went a little too long. I said, well, he's probably a really godly man. <laughs> the worship, they sang that same song. Oh, the worship was this. Oh, the pastor, this person didn't say hi to me. And you're sitting there, like, I feel like I'm watching a Siskel and Ebert thing where you're beginning to rate a Rotten Tomatoes rating of the service. It's like, oh, it's all about me instead of coming and being a blessing. And I've actually had to say, hey, what are you doing? I, I can do that when I go to another person's house and don't come to our church all day. What are you talking about? They say they, they sing the same 15 songs. Well, if that's what the pastor feels God's calling him to do, then you need to submit to it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Repent. Okay, I, I just enjoy myself so much. It's just, okay. Hedonism, the belief that pleasure or happiness or what I want in church. It's my, hedonism is what makes me happy. Listen, if I really did what made me happy, it's going to shock you. We'd have an organ over here, a piano over here, and brass instruments. We'd be singing hymns every Sunday. I like that. I do. Then why don't we do it? We're going to do some more of it. But I like that. I do. I like it. I like opera. Yeah, I like it, right, for about five minutes. Okay, so he knows it's not about what I want. It's about reaching people for Jesus Christ. If, if, if next year, and let's suppose that the popular music out there next year are playing kazoos and jumping on a garbage can lid and using and, and putting it in a sample and you're playing that and you rap. If that's what music is, guess what we're going to do next year? We're going to have kazoos and we're going to be stamping on top of a garbage can lid, rapping the name of Jesus if it reaches people. I'll do anything I can except for sin to reach people for Jesus Christ. Amen? Right? So it's not about what I want. Come on, if you're a parent, you don't want to get up in the morning and change a diaper at 2 o'clock in the morning, do you? Ah, the child will take care of itself. I'm going back to bed. No, you get up, you care, right? Because you want to make a difference in someone's life. Hedonism is all about your pleasure and your happiness. You see, true worship is not based on feeling. I got nothing out of it today. The Lord, the Lord isn't there. Oh, really? So you're the Holy Spirit police. You're the Holy Spirit barometer, huh? So, ba I mean, I, seriously, this has happened. Not in this church. I'm going to say it again. I've been to a church or a previous church where someone came in and said, oh, pastor, not me, but to my senior pastor, we got slimed today by the devil. It's like, what is this, Ghostbusters? 
right? I got slimed by demons. I thought, all oh, those demons in the room. And then someone else comes into the pastor and says, it was the most beautiful service I ever had. My heart was touched and my back was healed. And they had to experience God. So it's kind of arrogant to think you're the Holy Spirit barometer. It's not about your feelings. Because your feelings can lie to you. I don't know if you've noticed this, but if you run your life by your feelings, you're going to be a mess. Truth. You shall know the truth. And the joy of the Lord is my strength, not my feelings. My feelings. You think sometimes I don't want, sometimes I don't even want to be here. In fact, I heard of a person that woke up in the morning and his wife goes, you have time to go to churches. I don't want to go to church. People don't like me there. You have to go. You're the pastor. So, true worship is not based on feelings. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise. There are times I don't want to praise God. And so uh, me, today right now in our culture, there's a real desire for authenticity and being real, which is really refreshing in many ways. But it's gotten to the point, well, if I don't feel like worshiping God, I'm not going to worship. Listen, God is worthy of worship whether I feel like it or not. And so for me to come up here when I'm having a horrible day and to lift my hands, as the Bible says, lifting up holy hands, there's a... There's uh, all these psalms, over 100 psalms in the middle of your Bible talking to you to raise your hands and, and worship God. Well, I don't like that. Well, that's what God likes. So I'm going to raise my hands. I'm going to worship God. I'm going I'm to raise my voice whether I feel like it or not. Why? Because he's worthy of worship despite what I feel. And so when I begin to do that, something happens in my life, in your life. It's a sacrifice of praise to God, right? It isn't, by the way, it, worship is not just music. It's one of the attributes. It's putting all your energy towards something. It doesn't have to be music, but that's one of the aspects of it. Emotions is part of the aspects of it. That's the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to the Lord, the sacrifice of praise. So we have substitution, we make changes, we have pride, we have hedonism, and we have traditions. And we kind of dealt with that around, I like it this way. And there's nothing wrong with traditions. Traditions are great. Traditions were designed to help people experience God. The reason why they had the incense, the reason why they have all these things of getting up, sitting down, responsive reading, all that stuff was to, for a purpose to help people come to know God. Especially in church history, a lot of people could not read. So they had these traditions to help them understand, to, under, to connect with God. But what begins to happen is our traditions take over God. And even in our churches here today, you can see it happening. Well, that's not the way God moves. God does it this way. Why? That's the way he used to do it. And we start worshiping yesteryear. What God did in the past, we begin to worship. It happened with Hezekiah. Hezekiah had a staff with a, a snake around it that Moses made. And when Moses used it, God said, have the people look at the staff and they'll be healed of snake bites. Years go by, now this thing that was used back then, they're worshiping. And Hezekiah had to destroy it. Be careful. Everything is negotiable except for Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Okay, so we have our own traditions. Don't let traditions take the place of God. There's nothing wrong with traditions. We love traditions. But traditions are a mechanism to help us connect with God. They're not the end. They're a means to the end. And if they don't serve the end, then they're not worth the end. Right? It doesn't work. I don't want to do it anymore. So Jesus replied and said this, And why do you by your traditions violate the direct commandments of God? These Pharisees and Sadducees weren't taking care of their parents and other people. Say, they were telling them to give money to, to the temple, but not to the help their family. And he said, hey, your traditions, you are doing, you're neglecting the more important things, he says. So our traditions can violate the direct commandments of God. If we're not careful. It's all about our traditions. And this is what makes religion sick. Religion without God is disgusting. Church without Jesus is putrid and horrible. I want nothing to do with it. And sometimes I've been the reason why it was that way. Listen, Christ has to be the center of it all. If he's not, if he's not in the nucleus and something else gets in there, we're going to have multiplication of a sick church. Christ has to be in the center. You see, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away. God is more interested in your heart than he is in your outside parses that happen. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas and commands from, uh, as commands from God. This can begin to happen. So what kind of worship does God want? This is what it says in Psalm 50, which is a prophetic ver, uh, chapter in the, in the book of Psalms. It says this. I have no complaint about your sacrifices. I like when you come to church, right? 
or the burnt offerings and burnt offerings and, and all that was caught giving money to the church back in those days. They couldn't have money to give their burnt offerings and sacrifices and food. But I do not need the bulls from your barns or the goats from your pens. For all the animals of the forest are mine. All your 401k is mine. Your, your savings account, your stocks, all that's mine. And I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I, I, I know every bird on the mountains and all the animals of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For all the world is mine and everything in it. In other words, God says, I don't need your stuff. The reason I have you give and sacrifice is not for me, it's for you. It's a mechanism to keep you right before me. Do I eat the meat of bulls? Do I drink the blood of goats? No, why? This is what God wants, everybody. This is what he wants. Make thankfulness your sacrifice. It's hard to be thankful in our culture today, is it not? You know, they've done studies again. I, I know I keep on talking about this, but they've done, actually done studies. They show that when you, you're thankful, it actually helps your health, helps your brain. It helps you think better. It, it's actually healthy for you. Now, the Bible said it for millennia, and now science is saying it. Make thankfulness your sacrifice to God and keep the vows you made to the Most High. Then call on me when you are in trouble, and I will rescue you, and you will give me glory. What does God want? He wants what he does not have. What? God has everything. He's like my dad. I when I went to his birthday, I had no idea what to get him. He has everything. <laughs> what, what can you possibly give God that he doesn't already have? You can give back what he's given you. And what's that? Your worship. When you give God your worship, he's given you the ability to receive or reject him. When you bring him worship, it's beautiful to him because he loves you. Come on, folks that are parents and grandparents and, and, and you know those, and if you're not there yet, you'll understand later, but when your kids come up to you or, or when someone, or niece or nephew comes up to you or someone says, I love you, I care about you, there's something about it that's amazing. And when we come to God, it's an amazing thing. He wants our worship where we give everything to him. Why? Because we're designed to worship him. That's our design. And when we do our design, and by the way, the amazing thing is when you begin to worship God, though it may be difficult at first, and you calibrate yourself to the frequencies of God's DNA, of who he's made you to be, the spiritual part is connected. What begins to happen is you resonate. You become the true you you are designed to be because you're designed by God for God. You see, the true worship God loves is, is the following. Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman. He's talking to a woman that was a Samaritan. And uh, it's a great story, but this is what he said. The time is coming when it will be no longer, when no longer matter where you worship. Okay, at the time, it did matter where you worship. There was the temple. But Jesus was going to finish all that by going to the cross and getting rid of the old covenant way of doing things. Okay, the father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. But the time is coming. Indeed, it is here now, Jesus says. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. God wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, what's spirit and what's in truth? We could go on for 45 minutes about that. As a matter of fact, we're going for right now. Lock, ushers lock the doors. We're going on all day. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. What is that all about? What is that all about? Well, this is what happened. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit, with the spirit and in truth. Well, how is that supposed to look? What does that look like? Well, let me show you. When Jesus died on the cross, he says, uh, where are we going to worship? Jerusalem, Samaria? He said, no. The time is coming when it doesn't make a difference anymore. The true worship is not a place. It's a person. It's me. I'm the one. And this is what he says. Then the, when Jesus died on the cross, then the curtain in the temple was torn in two pieces from top to bottom. Also, the earth shook and rocks broke apart. And the old way of doing things, you had to go to the temple. You had to present your sacrifice. The priest would go in once a year. They'd go in behind the curtain to the Holy of Holies. They would put blood on the altar where the Ark of the Covenant was as a, an atonement for the people. When Jesus died on the cross, it didn't, that, was all, that was done away with. That was a down payment. That was a layaway plan. Now you can pick up what you've been waiting for for all these years. In fact, this is what happens. And, and, and the Bible makes it very clear. This is what it says. You should know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. No longer is there an actual temple that's important. You're the temple. 
So when someone comes to me, I can't believe they did that, they showed that movie in church. You watch it in your house, but that's different. No, it's not. You're the temple, not the church. We, we thank God for this place. We've dedicated this place, and we believe God's power and anointing resides here because we've dedicated it to him. But that's not where, this building is comes and goes. You are the temple. Therefore, your body is the temple. It's the, it's the vessel, and your spirit is in there. So your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. You have received the Holy Spirit from God. Now, how does that supposed to work? Well, listen to this. You do not belong to yourselves because you are bought by God for a price. So honor him with your bodies. Let, let me show you what's going on here, okay? This is Solomon's temple, or at least an artist's rendition of it, or computer-generated uh, image of it. You have the courtyards over here. You have over here, you have the, the place where they have the, the, uh, the lamps and all that, and you have the holies of holies over here. Let me show you how this works. Okay? The holy of holies in you and me is your spirit inside of you. That's the holy of holies. That's where God's spirit resides. It used to reside over here. Now it's in here. All right? Your soul is like this part over here. It's your mind, will, your emotions. And your body's the temple courts. It's amazing how this all works out, by the way. I could go on about this. But what we're talking about is real worship is God's spirit within you. Why does the Bible say, work out your salvation with fear and trembling? For it is God who is at work, what? Within you. Why? Because God's spirit is here. So pay attention to the Holy Spirit in you. Because God is in here. So this is the, this is the new temple, everybody. We're to worship God in that capacity. Then how should we worship? What are we supposed to do? Thank him with sincere affection. Thankfulness is a protection for you. Thank God for what he's done in your life. That's what the word of God talks about. And you yourself, as my wife read earlier, shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Heart, your emotion, your mind, right? With all your soul, everything inside of you. With all your mind, with all your strength. Worship God with your emotions. Worship God with your body. Worship God with everything that you have. And when you do that, you're calibrated. You're, 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 you're calibrated to this frequency of heaven. And everything gets lined up. And what begins to happen, there is like a reboot that happens in you. It's like an like antivirus protection on your computer. It begins to defrag the hard drive of who you are and gets rid of viruses because when you get God's program in you, it wipes out all the viruses. And this is what God has for us. How should we worship? Thank him. Offer him the control of my life. It's not my life. Lord, it is your life. See, brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a what? A living and holy sacrifice constantly. The kind that will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship. A living sacrifice. I'm going to trust you, God. You know more than I do. Listen, parents or guardians, you know a three-year-old does not know as much as you know. And they'll, they'll rant and rave and they'll get on the floor and they'll pound their fists and they'll go crazy because they want to play in the middle of Route 70. And you say, no. God knows what's best. Who are you? You're like a little piece of grain of sand, but God loves you anyhow. He's the God of all the universe. We know more than he does. Trust him, it works. Living a holy sacrifice. This is how we do it. So then how should we worship? This, the three things here. Make him the center of my life as the worship team makes their way up. Make him the center of your life. Not just a checklist, but everything should run through God. Is he the son of the universe of your life? Are you orbiting around him? Is his sunlight bringing life to you? Is there a photosynthesis of his grace upon your life that energizes and gives you life? Is he the, is, is, is he the center of your life? This is what God would have for us. For in him we live move and have our being for we are his offspring you see what God really wants everybody is a relationship maybe some of you grew up in a household where man if you didn't measure up to what mom or dad said you're not good enough 
you got to do it. And you know what the scary thing is? This is really, as a parent, this makes me really um, sober up in, in regards to parenting. A parent may have had all the right intentions, but the child might misunderstand what the parent's intention was. That's why we have to make it abundantly clear, parents, grandparents, why we're doing what we're doing. Rules without relationship equals rebellion. And so maybe you've experienced, you don't think God really wants a relationship. He really wants a relationship with you. That's what it's about. It's not about doing things. This is why God has you. He loves you. He's made you. You're made in his image, and, and you're beautiful, and God has a purpose for your life and my life. And are we calibrated correctly? Do we have viruses in us? Is our spiritual immune system compromised? Is the nucleus of your spirit getting infected? Are you reproducing sick spiritual cells? Let's let God transform us. You see, since we're receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. For our God is a devouring fire. Many of you are going to start enjoying having fire. You go to a campfire, you sit around a nice fire, you enjoy it. It brings you warmth, right? It's great. It's powerful. But you don't want to jump in the middle of a fire. God is a loving and powerful God. But remember, he's God and you're not. Now's the time of grace. Now's the time to get it right. You see, for this is how God loved the world. You know the story. God loved that he gave, every, he gave his son to us. Now, this is not just for people that are here that know Christ. This is for folks who don't know Christ and all of us. He's come to give us life, an abundant life. He loves us. He's a good father, everybody. And worship is the expression of love towards him. Worship makes sure that he's the center and you're not. Worship helps you to become, I know that almost sounds self-serving because it kind of is. Because when I worship God and I don't worry anymore and I give it all to him, guess what? I benefit. That's selfish. Well, not in a way it is, in a way it's not. Because in truth, I'm honoring God and as a result, my design is realized. When my design is realized, I have health. And that's okay with God. Does that make sense? So this is what God would have for us, everybody. Let me ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. How are you with God? Are you worshiping God or is something else take its place? Maybe your spiritual immune system has become very weak and you're catching infections. You don't even realize it. But you know that God's calling you to change the way you're doing things. He does it for your own good. So maybe have the Lord check you right now. What are some areas of your life right now where he's not the center of it all? Maybe it's things you're doing, you're compromising. Maybe it's things you're drinking, you're eating. Maybe it's things you're watching. Maybe it's relationships you're thinking. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's unforgiveness. I don't know what it is, but you're, you are bowing down to something else that's not God. And you're worshiping that. And God wants you to bow down only to one thing, him. That's freeing everybody. So Father, we ask right now you forgive us. And Lord, help us to realign our worship to the way we are designed to worship. Father, I pray you bless Cornerstone, bless everyone here, bless everyone watching right now. Lord, we say yes to you. We wanna receive your light and give your light away. We wanna receive your light and give your light away. We wanna be like solar panels. We wanna be like mirrors that take in your glory and shine forth your glory. Father, I pray this would be a place that would shine so bright, your light, that the darkness that is around us would see the light and the warmth of the light, bringing healing, restoration in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, let me ask you a question. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? I'm not asking if you believe in God, but have you surrendered your life? Say, God, it's not about me anymore. I give up control of my life. I hand over the keys of my life. I hand over the deed. It's not my life anymore. If you have not hand over your life, if you've not sacrificed your life and given up ownership, then you're not a, you're not a Christian. You're only a fan of the, the, of, the, of the theology of Christianity. A child of God is one that surrendered its rights and is adopted into God. And that happens for a couple ways. Number one, to realize that you are full of sin and you can't save yourself. Christ has paid the price. To receive that, 
and to give ownership over, and then you can be a child of God. That's all he asks for. So if you've never done that before, you've never completely given your life to Christ, or you've gone your own way for a long period of time, you want to get right, can you just, I'm going to pray in a few moments. Can you just give me a show of hands so I know how to better pray? Anyone just say this morning, Pastor, it's me, thank you. Anyone else this morning? Just say, I, I want to get, thank you. Anyone else? I want to get my life right with God. I want to give my life to Christ for the first time and renew it. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, let's just read four or five of you. Okay, let's go ahead and pray right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you right now to forgive me of all of my sins. I confess my sins and what I know. And what I don't, I also ask for you to forgive me. And I choose this day that I am no longer in charge of my life. I hand over ownership to you. You are now the owner of my life. I will submit my life to yours. Come fill me and have your way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You would open your eyes real quick. If you, you came in this morning, there was a little worship guide. All, also in the front pocket, there's a connection card. On the front part of it, it says, my decision today, I'm committing my life to Christ or I'm renewing my commitment. If you want to quickly fill that out, in a few moments, the usher's going to come by as we're going to give back to God our tithes and our offerings as part of worship. As we do that, I want to ask you to drop those cards in there. Also, um, as you leave here today, before we leave, on the right-hand side, there's an information desk. We have Bibles and a book called Fresh Start. Go and share with someone what's happened. As we close out our service with a, a worship song, we're going to have our prayer team. Well, go ahead, ladies and gentlemen. Go ahead and take the offering. Thank you. Um, did you do it already? Go ahead. Uh, as we sing this last song, we're going to ask our prayer team to come up. If you need prayer for anything at all, we'd be honored to pray with you about whatever you need. Maybe you need to tell someone, I prayed that prayer today. We want to help you along the way. Listen, we're all in this together, everybody. Amen? Let's worship God together. Let's all stand if we could. to worship with everybody this morning. If anybody needs prayer, please make your way to the front. We'd love to pray with you. For, for the rest of you, have a great week. And for those of you starting school, have an awesome first week.